Welcome to the Landscape Photography Show, episode number 26, and we are delighted to have a wonderful three-peat instructor with us, David Marks, and if you watched our anniversary show, number 25, uh, two weeks ago, you'll notice that he had been uh, absolutely adored by the landscape photography viewers. So we're, we're excited to hear about Lightroom and uh, some of the wonderful tricks that he has. I'm Cara Riley and the founder of Photo Tour Global Directory where consumers can connect with photographers all over the world for uh, workshops and tours. And I'm going to turn it over to Jim Worthman. He's going to introduce himself and then we'll get to our show starters. Thanks Cara. Uh, my name is Jim Worthman. I'm uh, kind of a, 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 a amateur photographer based in Phoenix, Arizona, the lovely desert southwest. Um, I'm uh, active both in uh, the landscape photography theme and the landscape photography community and uh, um, I do tonight have a special announcement um, and for those of you old enough to remember Schoolhouse Rock, this is brought to you by the letters B and W. So the landscape photography community has just opened a new category for monochrome. So if you haven't stopped by the community, I, I'd encourage you to do that. Take a look at the monochrome category, and by all means, we'd like to see some of your great monochrome work. And that's it. So, Tom. Okay, thanks, Jim. Um, I'm Tom Hurl, and I'm in Carmel, California, on the central coast of California. I'm an amateur photographer and curator on the landscape photography theme, and um, enjoy being a panel member on the show. So let me bounce it over to Kevin now. Let's go to Margaret, actually. Oops. Hi, everyone. I'm Margaret Tompkins from uh, Kansas City, Missouri, which has been looking a lot like Antarctica lately. <laughs> <laughs> I've been posting uh, uh, snowy pictures lately. It looks more like uh, uh, Kevin's neck of the woods out there in the mountains of Utah. Uh, but uh, uh, we've been uh, inundated with lots of snow and ice and and cold temperatures that we're not normally used to here. So uh, I've been kind of snowed in and kind of going uh, uh, crazy here. So uh, you'll have to just bear with me, I think. Um, great to be with you this evening. I'm so excited about uh, seeing David Marks here on our show. I think I've learned more from David than I do anyone else. He just has such a wonderful way of presenting things. Uh, but I'm an amateur photographer, uh, retired, and um, I just got my big girl camera, a Canon 6D, my first full sensor camera. Uh, so I've been trying to play with that, uh, even though the weather hasn't been cooperating with me very well. So. Uh, but I'm a, a full-fledged amateur and just love uh, uh, taking landscape photographs. And I, uh, like Jim, work both the uh, community, landscape photography community, and the landscape uh, photography theme, as well as uh, Kevin does both of those too. So uh, great to be here this evening, and now I will turn it over to uh, Kevin. All right. Thanks, Margaret. So, yeah, I'm Kevin Rowe, and uh, I'm in South Jordan, Utah. And though I'm in the mountains, it's been it's rained down in the valley here in the Salt Lake Valley, and it's just been snowing up in the mountains, which I like. You know, I like to keep it nice and keep the roads all clear down here in the valley, and tons of snow up in the mountains. So, uh, that's been good. Um, one other thing that I do is I put together a monthly uh, slideshow with all of the the best of the best that we've shared to the landscape photography theme and uh, I'll have uh, the one for January out here in the next couple days so uh, stop by and check that out and make sure you're sharing all your photos with the uh, appropriate tags so that we can find your photos so you can make that slideshow. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go right into uh, our show starter so let me share my screen here Okay, does everyone have that? So this well, is there we go. There it is. Good. Okay. Yeah. So this is my uh, my pick, and this is George Fletcher, and uh, this is just an awesome overlook he's found here and got a great picture of. 
and uh, George is a regular contributor and does a great job. Awesome shot. And that, I believe this is you, Margaret? Yes, that's mine. Uh, Richard uh, Creamer, who's one of our uh, regular uh, contributors, that's a beautiful shot of Yosemite. Uh, just love the waterfall there, the the water, the reflections, the trees, the granite, just everything. Uh, just uh, awesome photograph there. A wonderful light, uh, just absolutely gorgeous. So that was my pick for the show starter. Beautiful. Thanks, Margaret. And Tom? I, I picked this one from uh, Gunther Zettel. Um, I really like the crispness of this. I, I liked all the gray, the gray rocks and the, the gray sky, um, highlighted by the, the bright sunset. I also liked how it was balanced with the sunset on one side and the, the lighthouse with a little red light on the other side. So this one really appealed to me. Yeah, I love the mood in that. That's great. We can okay, feel and it. And then uh, Kara. All right. This is uh, um, Tom Sloan, who is also a regular contributor to the landscape photography theme. And um, I just love the way that you can see the, the snow and the, the footsteps that are in there, but the amazing light rays uh, as the blue hour was approaching. And um, I, I really think the balance here is, is nice. So excellent work, Tom Sloan. Thanks for sharing with our event and uh, becoming a show starter. Yeah, we love Tom. Tom's always got great stuff. Yeah. Okay, and then David, this was your pick. Um, yeah, this one is from, I'm, I'm going to butcher the name, uh, Jorg uh, Schumacher. And uh, I just think the, the leading line of the road there uh, pulls my eye right right into the scene and, and I love the background atmosphere and I uh, just think it has a real sense of travel and, mo and dynamic motion and uh, it's got something of interest on, on every plane. I like it. All right. Great. Yeah. Beautiful. I like it too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then uh, last one, uh, Jim. Yeah. Thanks. This is Robert Glockner. And uh, I, I love the, just the, the composition and the, the silhouette, the, the saturated colors. Um, it all worked well for me, the reflection, of course. And, uh, you know, in his, in his uh, comment there, you can see it. He uh, did a two-exposure HDR, and he talks about, you know, a little bit about his workflow with Photomatics and uh, uh, Lightroom, and then uh, finishing it off in Color Effects Pro. So I thought that was apropos to our chat tonight. Great. Yeah, I think so. So that uh, that brings us to our main uh, man for today is David Marks. And David uh, does quite a few uh, workshops and things. And I'm sure we'll put up uh, his information in the show notes after the show. So if you like what you, you hear, you might want to check him out and get some more information. But uh, we'll go over to you, David. Well, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Um, I, first, it's it's an honor. I'm I'm thrilled to be here again. Um, I think it was about almost a year ago that I that I first met um, most of you, Jim and Cara and and uh, Margaret. I'd met in person a little before that, uh, but it's just a pleasure to be back. And um, I'm just so delighted that uh, that this has passed 25, 26. Are we at 27? Somewhere in there. We're on uh, 26. 26. What a what a remarkable accomplishment, and uh, really what an honor to be here. Uh, and so tonight, um, uh, what I thought I would show, I thought I would show just some of my favorite buttons in Adobe Photoshop Lightroom for working primarily with uh, landscape photography. So let's see. Uh, let me bring up Lightroom here, and um, let me switch to screen sharing, and you guys tell me. Oops. I get this wrong. So let's oh, see. Oh, good. <laughs> we uh, didn't lose you. <laughs> so let me make this a little bigger on the screen. And at this point, uh, hopefully you're seeing, oh, about seven or so of my photos inside of Lightroom. Yes, yep. we yeah. are. We can see that. Awesome. So what I did for tonight is I picked out uh, six or seven little example photos from from places I've shot or or uh, places I, I'm going, 
And um, I thought I would just show a couple of the buttons in the fun part of Lightroom, in the develop module, uh, just some simple tricks that can, that can improve photos like this quickly and easily. Now, so what I'll do is I'll take, say, this first photo, and I'll slide from Lightroom's library module over to develop. Two easy ways to do this. You can click develop up here on the what they call the module picker, this top right side of the screen, or keyboard shortcut is the letter D. I wish all the shortcuts were that easy, but uh, off to develop we go. Now, I have to point out something here about the type of file I'm working with. I'm working with a, a DNG file, a raw file. Could be CR2 from a Canon, could be NEF from a Nikon, uh, OLY from an Olympus, on and on and on. But the button I want to show first is one that you won't have, uh, or you won't have any fun with, if you're photographing in JPEG. Now, I don't mean to say that photographing in JPEG is bad or that you'll lose out on this uh, in life, but if you shoot in JPEG, the button I'm about to demo, you had that choice in your camera before you clicked the trigger. If you shoot in RAW, one advantage is you get this, this what I'll call bonus button when you get home. And the bonus button lives, of all bizarre places, in the last panel of Lightroom's develop module. It lives down here in camera calibration, which sounds really scary. And in fact, within that scary panel, it lives here where it says profile. Now, a lot of the stuff in camera calibration is scary, but this profile button, not at all. It, this profile button, what it, what it really is, or what I, would, what I would have described it as, is the film I wish I'd had in my camera back in the film photography days. So let me click here, and a little list will pop up. Now, I have to explain that the list that you might see with your files and the list that I'm going to see may be different. The list that pops up here, Adobe Standard, uh, Camera Landscape, hopefully you guys can see those. Um, these are the profiles that Adobe has created. I would call them film types for a Canon photographer. A Nikon photographer will see a different list. Uh, Olympus photographer, yet another list. Now again, these only appear if you're shooting in RAW. But watch what happens if I pick, instead of the standard type of film, what if I had had, say, landscape film in my camera? For those with a background photography, like, like for you, Jim, I know that we'd talked about black and white before. Uh, back in the day, do you remember Fuji Velvia? Or oh, yeah. E100VS? Mm -hmm. When we used to shoot Velvia or E100VS, the Kodak equivalent, the very saturated, what we were buying was a film whose chemistry had been tailored to do two things, add saturation, add contrast to a color photo. So when I pick camera landscape, can you see the difference here? Let me turn this on and off. Watch these blues like up here in this corner, before, or sorry, sorry this would be before, after. Can you see a big difference in the contrast and in the saturation of the blue? Before, yes. After here. Let me show it this way. Let me split the screen right and left so you can see a standard interpretation of color. Let me zoom in, say, down here. Standard, pretty low muted pastel, much more vibrant, much higher contrast. Or I think perhaps these are even more telling. Stronger bluer clouds, kind of flat gray clouds. So for the photographer who's shooting primarily landscape photos in RAW, you might find that telling it to start with a higher contrast, higher saturation interpretation of color gives you a better starting point in a single button. And in fact, a lot of folks like me who, who sort of beta test for Adobe, folks who do this all the time, we begged for them to put this starting point button up here at the top of the basic panel, but they won't. And the reason they won't is, I think, I can't speak for Adobe, I'm not you know, an employee, the reason they won't move it up there is of course that button does nothing for the JPEG photographer. If you're shooting in JPEG, you have the same settings, the same button, but you have it inside the camera 
and so the choice is made at the time of capture. So they hide it down here, and they give it a scary name. But <laughs> but it's so powerful to go from this, oop, to go from say this to this, in a single button. It's a great one for me. Let me show you one more of these just for demo. Um, how about let's see if this will work. I'll take a, a a flower, a sunset shot, fairly standard landscape. Right now, it's in the standard interpretation of color. Let's call that a, a flat, muted, you know, sort of neutral film. Let's see what happens if I flip through the list. This would be another interpretation of color. This would be the, quote, landscape interpretation. This is the even more neutral. This is the portrait interpretation. And another set of colors. Now the thing I want to point out here is I don't always pick landscape. In this case I think it looks pretty good, but I also think the portrait one looked pretty good. That I flip through this list with every photo I bring in and I ask myself which one will give me the best starting point. Let's see if you can see the difference when I zoom in here. Can you see the flower and the clouds behind it? Mm -hmm. If I have the choice, I'd rather start with this cloud and this flower than the more pastel over here on the left. Now, what I have to say, though, is just because you pick a better starting point, the job isn't done. What this photo needs, it needs to be a little brighter. It needs more detail in the highlights. It needs more detail in the shadows, a white, a black, uh, some more vibrance, some more contrast. But with just a couple of buttons, we can go from, say, there on the left to there on the right. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. And this is, this is one of the reasons that shooting in RAW for the landscape photographer might be advantageous. The advantage is that when you get home, you can control all the interpretation of color. Should it be standard? Should it be faithful? Should it be? The words don't really mean anything to me. What I care about is what I call the, the visual pop. And if I can get this kind of pop compared to, say, that in five buttons, I'm a pretty happy guy. Because mm -hmm. this is what I want. Uh, this is the kind of photo I want to display. David? Sure. Just a real quick question. Um, a lot of times we end up having to dig detail out of the shadows, mm -hmm. right? And it can get noisy. Um, when you select, let's say, the, the landscape preset there, and, and as your starting point, it, it really boosted the contrast. Does that affect your ability later to dig detail out of the, out of the shadows, or for that matter, um, out of the highlights? I don't think it's going to affect your ability. Uh, here, let me uh, let me change from screen share back to to uh, let's see if see if my face comes back up. Uh, there we are. Um, if I'm going to answer a question, I feel like it's weird to talk to a blank screen. Um, uh, I wouldn't say it's going to limit your ability to pull detail out of the highlights and shadows, but it does push the histogram when it adds contrast. It makes the darks darker and the light's lighter. Yeah. Some of the interpretations will clip, will push past that inky black. Some will push past paper white. Mm -hmm. So if you lose detail there, that the stuff that's beyond the edge of the spectrum may be harder to recover. But on a photo where it doesn't push it off the scale, um, I don't think it's going to do you any harm. Okay. Uh, Mostly the highlights and shadows slider, uh, they're going to pull the very darks, the very lights. Push those to paper white and inky black, you've limited your possibilities. Mm. But within the framework, within inky black and paper white, I think you'll be okay. Okay. Thank you. Good, good, good. Good question. David, one follow-on from that. Can I think of these as presets maybe? You can think of them as presets, but they're camera or brand of camera specific. So they're a little different than a preset that says add saturation, which would be, say, camera brand irrelevant. That, that what Adobe has tried to do for more technicals, they've tried to reverse engineer 
the picture styles or profiles right. that you have inside your camera. So a, a Nikon user is going to have a different set of picture styles or profiles than a Canon user. And this is Adobe's way of, of basically keeping up with the options that a JPEG photographer, someone shooting in JPEG would have. So yes, they are presets, but they're a little more nuanced than the presets that we see on the left side in Lightroom. Okay. Uh, so, so say I, I do bring it in on the, using the landscape mode that increases the saturation, increases the contrast, and I find I'm clipping at either end. Can I then roll back the contrast with the contrast slider? Sure, because and these just, just to back that to, way to kind of answer Jim's question. Yeah, exactly. That these uh, they're a starting point, not a finishing button, uh, and and ironically they're where I start with every raw file, every landscape file that I bring in. I go and pick the one that best suits my needs, and then I go back up on the screen to the basic panel, to the contrast slider, to say, well, I like. This is a starting point, but it's not perfect. I don't mean to say that these are a one-button panacea, that you push it and your photo is magically wonderful. Um, but if I can start with, like in the old days, if I could buy Velvia and shoot mm -hmm. Velvia for sunset, that was better than shooting a, a more neutral film, um, a Provia or Ektachrome, or that, that, it, that they give me a better beginning, but not all. it's not everything in one. Yeah, just real quick. I I have uh, I I always use this. In fact, I use the the camera landscape so often that I actually just have it as one of my presets for when I'm importing landscapes. And I'll go take it off sometimes. I'll go look at it. But um, like on my Canon files, you saw what he just had on there. Versus my Sony files, I have about five more options in that uh, screen. So they're different for each camera like you were saying. How does it, does it determine from the file then that is brought in, uh, that's imported, as to what options are available there? Yep, absolutely, Margaret. What it's doing, what Adobe is cleverly doing, is they're reading the metadata, and where it says Canon camera, or Canon 5D Mark III, or Sony AR7, it says, oh, well, if that's the camera, then these are the profiles that would have been available or our best guess at the profiles that are available okay. internally within that that model of camera uh, and so like for a Nikon photographer the list will say Nikon Vivid, Nikon D2X, Nikon you know it's it's looking at the metadata and saying oh well these are the ones that make sense cool yeah good okay. alright well here let me show you another button then. let me see if I can redo this screen share uh, awesome thanks y'all it's it's much more fun to talk to uh, uh, talk to people than to a blank screen. Let's see. Are we back in Lightroom? <laughs> Not quite. Nope. Not quite. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, let me uh, let me try that one more time. Screen share, desktop, and how did yeah. I do this time? There we go. Oh. Now we're good. <laughs> All right. So. So um, when I'm working on a file like this, I would love to tell you that I start in the develop module in the basic panel, but I don't. I start down here in the camera calibration panel. I pick my starting point, landscape, standard, portrait, whatever it happens to be, and then I go back up to basic. And, and if it was always that clean and simple, I could deal, but there's one other button or one other set of buttons along the way that I really, really like. So, like, so let me slide over a photo, and this is one of the uh, of the Northern Lights of the Aurora. Uh, this is one I shot last year, uh, teaching a photography workshop. I'm headed back up there to uh, Churchill, Manitoba, in about two weeks, and you can see that I've already set it to landscape, and, and truth be told, I've already done some adjusting. Uh, to make this photo look good on the screen. But there is a problem here. It's subtle, but a problem. And the problem is that I'm using this Canon 20, uh, 16 to 35 lens. Now, this is a, like a fancy Canon L lens, but all lenses 
they bend light and they vignette. To some degree, they're bowing. You can see how these trees kind of tilt in at a weird angle. And the corners in here are very, very dark. So one of the other buttons that I love in Lightroom, it's this whole panel called Lens Correction. And what Lens Correction will let us do, it will give the illusion of a better camera lens than I can actually afford, or to be honest, than Canon actually makes. So just to be fair, the five panel across that I have here, the one that says basic profile color manual, that's the look in Lightroom 5. For folks using Lightroom 4, you'll have just three tabs, profile, color, and manual. For teaching purposes, let me start in the profile tab. Now, Margaret, you said when I was showing the landscape, the, 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 the starting point, the film type buttons, you said, how does it know? Well, it reads the metadata. And the same thing ought to happen here. If I tell it to repair my lens, again, they use the scary word po profile, but I would use the word the illusion of a better lens. When I turn this on, it's supposed to read what type of camera and what type of lens. Now, let me turn this on and off a couple of times. Watch the corners of the photo down in here before, after. Wow. Can you see how much vignetting, how much shadow is cast yeah. down in those corners? Yep. Now, there are times in photography when a vignette is beautiful. For, for the, like, like for Jim, back in the darkroom days, we used to intentionally vignette the corners because it drives the eye into the middle. And, and so I don't mean to say that vignetting is always a bad thing, but I feel like here an awful lot of my photo is falling into inky black where visually there's a whole lot more interest when that shadow that my lens is casting is removed. And in this case it's literally one button easy. Now the reason it's one button easy is that Adobe is able to read that this was shot with a Canon camera using this particular lens and that they've done some testing and they've made this correction for this particular lens. In fact, what I'm going to pull up here is a whole list of all the different lenses that they have, quote, profiled, meaning tested. They've tested to say how much does it vignette, how much does it distort uh, geometrically. Not every lens is on the list. And so here I, I want to point out that results will vary. If you're using a Canon camera and a Sigma lens, a Vivitar lens, a Zeiss lens, a third-party lens, it might not be in the list. If you're using uh, an adapter, like on a mirrorless camera, so you can use you know, Canon lenses on a Sony mirrorless body, you can't expect that they've done the mapping for every possible combination. So this is not a button that's going to work for everyone all the time. But when it works, well, I, I feel like I owe Adobe a thank you. Thank you for making <laughs> me a better lens than I actually have, or at least the illusion of a better lens than I actually David, have. David, what was the name of that correction lens that you just clicked on? So I, I just turned on the button, the Enable Profile Corrections within Lens okay. Correction. And it sensed what camera what lens. It doesn't always get it right. It gets it right 99% of the time, but not always. Uh, just for visual variety, let me show this one more time. I know this is a landscape photography show, but I think this becomes really apparent with architecture photos. And here I'm using a 24 millimeter lens, a wide angle lens, and you can see how it's bending these columns, how it's bowing the geometry. When I turn this on, can you see how it flattens out that yeah. bowing? Yes. And so it does two things. It removes both some of the geometric distortion, that's what this controls, some of the pin cushion, if you will, and it removes some of the vignetting, some of the darkening of the corners. On this photo, it's the distortion, the geometric distortion, that's the most visible. 
In the other photo, it's the vignetting that's most visible. And what's so cool here is there are times when you want the distorted geometry, there are times when you want the vignetting. So a little further down, we have these controls where I can decide whether I want it removed or whether I want to keep it. Or, in the case of the vignette, should the corners go dark? Should the corners go light? And, and that's what these last two, or these two, two controls down here do, is they let you decide, should I have some of that correction, but not all of the correction? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. And, and, and what I think is amazing about this is I'm spending every penny I can scrounge on the best camera lenses I can afford. Both of these photos were shot with Canon, L, you know, their highest quality, fanciest level lenses. But even at the highest quality lens, we still have vignetting. We still have geometric distortion. But as a photographer, that's not what I want to show in my image. What do you think? That, that's almost in the realm of magic. It's almost <laughs> in the realm of magic. It really is. And it's just almost magic. The, it, there's your new name, David, the magic of Lightroom. It, it is. It's one of those things, you know, like, I don't work for Adobe. I have no incentive to sell you on Lightroom. But one thing I can tell you is that Lightroom makes my photos look better than yeah. they really are. I'm getting the appearance of a better lens than I actually own. Uh, I'm getting better color than uh, I'm getting. I'm getting so much flexibility and so much improvement over uh, over what was actually captured. Mm -hmm. I love it. Now, David, uh, uh, sure. I'm thinking maybe maybe I I don't think I've been to one of your seminars, but maybe I was like sleeping or something and and uh, listening to because we have the exact same flow in Lightroom. It's great. Uh, I go well, down to camera calibration and then go to lens corrections, click that, and then move up. Yeah, and 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 this is one of the things that you know one of the reasons I uh, I sort of teach this is I wish that Lightroom's develop module flowed from the top down. That is how it's designed. We're supposed to start in basic and work our way down. But there are these other buttons for folks who shoot in RAW. I would say for folks like you and me, Kevin, working on landscape photos that are not at the top. And so my actual pattern is go pick a better film, better starting point, fix the flaws in my lens, then go back up to the basic panel and come down from there. I wish I could rearrange these into a yeah. logical order, but I can't. What I can learn is a pattern, and it sounds like you and I have basically the same pattern. In fact, I would argue, I would bet that a lot of folks with, a, with Lightroom experience are going to say, yep, that's the same pattern I follow. Yeah. Um, it's we, not... we have a couple of things, if I could just... Um... Sure. Ask here, okay. I'm uh, selecting this. Uh, Richard Kramer has asked, "How is this different from tone curve medium contrast?" And I don't know if that. Are you there? Yep, I'm here. Oh, uh, okay. So I think Richard's question was about the um, the camera profile button. Uh, yeah, it might have been. Yep, I think it was. I saw it flash on the side. And okay. the answer there is that they're both similar and different in that when you pick the profile, you are indeed adding contrast. That's what the tone curve settings do, whether it's high contrast, medium contrast, or low contrast. But the camera profile is also changing the level of saturation, the strength of color, so it's as if you're doing tonal contrast and a boost to the saturation slider. Uh, it's, it's as if you're doing two and one back there. Um, so just picking tone curve medium contrast is going to push the ends of your histogram, where's my camera, further out, right? It's going to add that, that snap, but it's not supposed to. Oh, there's so it's going to push them further out, 
but it's not supposed to change the level of intensity of our colors. Okay. And uh, um, Richard did say yes, the profile button. So now, just because uh, in the order of time, I am going to read these two. One, a comment, and maybe you can comment on this, uh, David. Another comment, the correct chromatic aberration button, not sure of the button name, mm -hmm. can be extremely beneficial. That's Yes. Uh, that seems like... One of the other features in the lens correction panel is the ability to remove chromatic aberration. And uh, uh, I can demo this. Um, but a but, uh, simple synopsis, our lenses have many types of flaws, vignetting, geometric distortion, and then this, this hard to pronounce one, chromatic aberration. And that's when we start to see weird colored fringes around what ought to be a clean edge. And amongst the magical things that, that the geniuses at Adobe have done is uh, they've, they've, they've figured out how to f remove the vignetting. They've also figured out this amazing formula to remove some of these weird color fringes. L let me show you one because um, that's another – it wasn't the feature of the lens panel I meant to demo, but it's a, m a marvelous one. So give me just a second here. Let me uh, – See if I can do this again. Um, cross your fingers. Going to screen share. <laughs> there we go. Uh, and let me grab a photo. Uh, let me zoom in on this photo here. And I'll show an area. Let me zoom this way in. Uh, let me zoom it in, say, over here. Can you see a green and purple stripe around those windows? Yep. That's chromatic aberration. What's happening there is that what ought to be a nice edge is showing the scattering of light, either light passing through the window, but more likely light passing through my lens. Now I had to zoom in in the right place. Let me zoom back out to show this. I had to zoom in at the side of my photo and along something that ought to be a nice edge. You're never going to find the flaw smack dab in the center. The, the, uh, let's not sweat the physics, but chromatic aberration happens at the sides of our photo uh, where there ought to be a nice edge. And in fact, what Adobe has done is they've made this brilliant button in the lens correction panel to remove that flaw. And so when I click this one on, can you see that purple and green stripe disappear? Mm, yeah. yeah. Yeah, again, flaws in our lens. We have vignetting, we have geometric distortion. We also have this scattering of light, and they've figured out a way to make that disappear as if I had better glass than I actually own. Uh, now, to be fair, the more you spend on your camera lens, the less of this flaw you're supposed to have. Like, the, the L in Canon, the L Canon means low dispersion, less chromatic aberration. The Nikkor, Nikon lenses, the Sigma, what does Sigma say? APO, I think. You know, the higher the quality glass plate, the less of this flaw you're supposed to have. But all lenses have this flaw. You can see it perhaps side by side. Let me zoom this in one further here. Can you see the purple stripe on the left? Yeah and how there's no purple stripe on the right? Yes. The, so uh, whoever asked this question, thank you. Uh, this was not a feature I'd intended to demo, but if you're going to go fixing the flaws in your lens, you might as well fix both the geometric bowing, the vignetting, and the aberration. And so to bring this, uh, say, to Lightroom 5, because folks like Kevin and I have been pushing these buttons again and again, in Lightroom 5, not in 4 or previous, Adobe added this little tab, the basic tab. And so we can turn on this and this and save ourselves the trip into those other two. In fact, we can turn on both of these and a new feature uh, that's supposed to, say, make our walls more vertical, like so. Uh, 
all sorts of neat new wow. tricks in Lightroom 5. Let me let me show the before and after here. Bowed, vertical. Yeah. Oh, First I like it. Correction. Uh, yeah. But but that's not really fair. This is an architecture shot, and I'm supposed to be talking about landscape <laughs> photography. Okay. Uh, we had uh, another comment here. I'll just go uh, quickly on this one. For those of us, this is from Chris Whiting. Um, those of us without the fastest processing computer, Lightroom runs better if lens corrections are done last. Do you have a comment on that, David? Um, I think that's probably true. I I think there are other buttons as well, like clarity and sharpening, that you might also want to delay using if your computer is is already chugging along. Um, uh, so, so yes, I, I, I personally have poured my money into the souped-up computer because I hate <laughs> waiting around. All right. um, but I think so we'll Chris Whiting is probably giving good advice there. We'll thank Chris for that. Now, here's one more, and then we'll let you uh, finish. David, can you explain the setup menu and its options, default auto custom, that shows up when you check enable profile connections in lens correction panel? Oh, hi, Jan. Uh, that one's from Jan Kabili, and this is a loaded question because she knows enough to call me out if I get this wrong. Uh, oh. oh boy. Uh, there you go, Jan. Uh, let's see. Um, I don't know the official uh, Adobe explanation, but um, here's how I would here's how I would explain it, and I may well be wrong. Let's see if I can uh, start the screen share one more time. Um, when you go in here and you pick the profile, um, this setup, well, how do I explain this? Um, the default is letting, uh, a do letting Lightroom read the metadata and guess at what's going on in here. The custom is where you could define this camera and this lens and then save it out as a new setting. So for example if I work with say, let me pick a completely wrong lens, uh, let me pick something that's totally wacky here, uh, well, I need something more visibly wacky than that. Uh, let's pick something that just, there we go, something that, that messes it all up. But let's pretend that this was uh, Canon lens, a uh, Canon camera, Sigma lens. And you could dial all these in until they were right, and then you could save it as a new one. And that could be your new default when it reads it. But the one that I can't explain is how auto differs from the standard behavior. So you got me there, Jan. I, I still don't know how auto is different uh, than the default or the custom. And okay. I don't either. So All right. Don't well, <laughs> what we should probably do is uh, watch our time here, David, and we have about seven minutes to finish up what you've uh, done. And we thank everybody for these questions. And it could be that um, David might be able to go through the questions and we could have some links to some of your um, Lightroom demos that answer, might answer some of what we're hearing here. Uh, I'll do my best. Uh, well, here, uh, in seven minutes, let me show you one more then. Uh, let me take this image. I shot this uh, last week. I was teaching a, a winter photography workshop in Yellowstone. And uh, I imagine this is kind of a famous American landmark, uh, Old Faithful. This is just before it erupts. Um, I find that when it actually erupts, it's kind of hard to photograph. Uh, it gets very, especially in the winter, it gets very steamy. But I love sunrise and sunset out here at the Valley of the Geysers. Now, let me point out, this is a raw file. And... Uh...